Good morning, and thank you so much for joining me for Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I am your host, Dr. Angela Buckchester. You know what I like to do on the show. I want to invite you. I want to inspire you. I want to empower you to become your best self. Now, Scripture reminds us that the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And today we want to get you fired up about accountability and alignment. My guest today is Dr. John Polis, and he has written the book, Biblical Headship, Making Sense of Submission to Authority. Now, the many abuses of authority in homes and schools and churches and government have left people with a determination to avoid relationships with authority. If at all possible, forcing kind of a independent spirit that may lead to isolation. Now, we're going to delve even more into that topic, but I want to tell you a little bit more about John. He holds a BA and an MA in Bible theology with over 30 years in ministry as an apostle to the body of Christ. He is founder of Revival Fellowship International. Um, He is an ambassador apostle with the International Coalition of Apostles, and he is a U.S. Marine Vietnam veteran. Now, I want to say, you know, to all of my veterans out there, thank you for your service. And I have already thanked Dr. John Polis for his service as well. Without you, I don't know where we would be as a country. Thank you for your service. Now, you know what I'm about to say, you guys. Go on. Get comfy. Get cozy. Get your coffee or get your tea because we are about to get started. So I want to go on and pass the mic to John. Good morning, John. How are you? Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, Well, thank you, doctor, and I'm so happy to be with you today. It's a real blessing and opportunity to talk to you and your audience about this wonderful subject. I agree. You know, I want to ask you a little bit about all that you have done. Being in ministry for over 30 years, is that something that you knew that you wanted to do even as a a young adult or as a young person that is being in ministry? No, ma'am. Actually, uh, I left the the life of religion when I joined the uh, Marine Corps in 1968. And uh, when I got out of the Marine Corps in 1970, after my tour of duty in Vietnam, I went down the road of uh, drugs and alcohol for about four years and had God was nowhere in my thinking. But the Bible says Jesus came to seek and save the lost, and I certainly qualified. And Mm -hmm. he one day just uh, got in my way and tracked me down. (laughs) And... and, uh, I uh, gave my heart to Jesus in August of 1974, and, uh, you know, the call of God is an unusual thing. It's, I like to tell people that the call of God can be identified when you see a need that is calling to you, and you know you just have to do something about it. It, it may not be, you know, hearing a voice, hey, John, go preach the gospel. Mm-hmm. It, it may be that you just see a glaring need that keeps calling you, and that's what happened to me. I, I was in the Word real strong, just studying the Bible as a new Christian, and I just saw the need in God's church for uh, caring for God's people and for teaching them the Word of God, and, and that call just wouldn't let me go. I was in Bible college then by 1977, and 1980, I pastoring my first church. It was like a whirlwind and still there. Wow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. I, I really love it. But you know what? You put a mouthful there. And as far as God places a calling on each of our lives, and you know it's true because you can't shake it. No matter yeah. what, you, you kind of see it all around you in different forms and different fashions. People sometimes will even, will even say something like, you know what, you should, whatever it is, you should be a pastor, a preacher, a deacon, you should go into ministry, whatever it is, you should write a book, whatever it is, it is so interesting how God will do that. You you are so right about that. 
Now, mm-hmm. as far as being an author is concerned, is that something that you've always wanted to do, or did you just find that now was the appropriate time to share your message? Well, actually, it wasn't something that I ever intended to do. Uh, I one day just had that in spark of inspiration that, you know, God has given me something to say, and I don't know if anybody will be interested in reading it, but I know it comes from God, and I know it helps people, and I'm just going to start putting it in print and see what happens. That's kind of the way it went. Now I've written mm-hmm. 15 books, and uh, they're they're helping a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. And isn't isn't that just amazing? Like you said, I, I don't know if anyone's going to read it. Hopefully someone does, and you start getting the numbers. And I remember the, the first time I sold a book, literally the first book that I sold, and I saw the little number pop up there, and I went, oh, my goodness, that's happening. I sold a book. You know, and I was so <laughs> excited. And then, like, the first international sale that you have, and then um, – when it hits a certain number, whatever that number is for you, a hundred or a thousand or whatever, and you and I know me, I I was just so humbled by it all. I was just like, Lord, wow, like this is really reaching people. This is really helping people. How amazing this is! So yeah, now I don't have fifteen books. So I don't have that experience. So I'm going to give you a high five on that one. You know, okay. that, that's awesome. But yes, definitely making a difference in someone's life. Now, your current book, Biblical Headship, Making Sense of Submission to Authority. I, I want to ask you about uh, the word submission and the word authority. Now, for so many people, we think of submission only when we're talking about our wedding vows, and people feel a certain way about that. We think about authority sometimes only in the context of, like, a boss or perhaps law enforcement. Before we really delve in, can you put us on the same page? What do you mean by submission, the word submission, and when you use the word authority? Well, the word submission, it actually means to come under the mission, sub, under, to come under the mission of another, uh, whether it be the mission of your local church or the mission of, in general, the kingdom of God, uh, the mission of your, your, your company that you work for, the mission of, uh, of like our federal government, you know. So it, it really means to be in support, you know, to come up under the mission. It, a lot of people confuse the idea of submission with uh, being lorded over or some kind of a dictatorial uh, situation. And, and really that's not what it's all about. In the kingdom of God, all submission is voluntary. And so I voluntarily recognize a mission that God's calling me to to be a part of, and I come under that mission to support it, to hold it up, and make sure that that vision actually comes to pass. So that's that's my contact of, of submission. Of course, there's an aspect of submission that involves obedience because we are uh, voluntarily submitting ourselves to the authority that is in charge of that particular mission, whatever it might be. And so I must... Uh, uh, become obedient to voluntarily, of course, to to the authority that is responsible for that mission being accomplished. So there is that aspect of, of obedience when you talk about authority. Uh, Hebrews thirteen seventeen is the scripture that says, obey them that have the rule over you and guide you, uh, for they must give an account for your soul, and they need to do it with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So we see that there's great profit, the benefit, in other words, that comes into our lives as we properly recognize authority, align ourselves with it through our obedience to whatever the requirements are uh, that that authority is is uh, giving us for accomplishing the mission that we are we're submitting to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love that. Now, you talk about biblical headship. What is headship in the Bible? Okay, headship is just is is really 
God's system of, of governing. Uh, headship was involved in the Old Testament. The elders of Israel were, were the leaders of Israel. Uh, in the home, the husband is, the Bible calls the husband the head of the wife. Uh, and there's a lot that can be said about that to, to uh, unscramble a lot of confused thinking. But uh, then we have Jesus, who is himself the head of the church. So headship is, 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 involves Jesus Christ himself. And the whole idea of headship is not just so somebody could be in charge, although we need people to be in charge of the institution, whatever it might be, but uh, we need, God needs someone to hold accountable for his will being done. And that mm-hmm. is what headship is all about. When, when, God mm-hmm. made, when God made the husband the head of the wife, he's basically saying, I chose you to be the person I'm going to hold accountable for my will being done in that marriage institution. That's why it's, it's a heavy thing. Uh, in marriage, there's been a lot of confusion about the idea of the male headship and the man being the head. It's kind of like the man is superior to the woman. And God didn't choose the man because he was superior, because he created male and female, both of them to have dominion, both of them to have the same access to God's uh, presence and, and spiritual gifts and grace and power. There's no inferiority at all involved. It's just simply that God chose the man to be the the one in that institution, in that marriage union, that he's going to hold accountable for his will being done. So men need to realize that when you decide to get married as a Christian person, that now what you're saying is, God, I'm willing to do your will in this relationship, and you hold me accountable. I will submit to you for whatever your will is. It's my responsibility to find out what the will of God is for this family and to make sure that will is being done to recruit the other family members into that mission, whatever it is, and God's going to hold me accountable. Many times in relation in marriage relationships, doctor, the, the husband will abdicate uh, that responsibility and give it to the, to the woman who may be more submissive to God, and uh, the woman then ends up being the one responsible to make sure that God's will is done in the family, and, and that becomes a great burden to the lady because God has given grace to the person that he's called to do a particular uh, responsibility. So the husband has grace to, to lead his home if he's willing to accept the responsibility and make sure that he's accountable for God's will being done in that marriage. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I like how you've also uh, mentioned that in this headship that there is freedom, that there is peace, and that there is a bit of joy. Um, we have about a minute left before we need to go to break, though, but can you explain what you mean by that? Well, you know, submission, is it brings great freedom into our life because now I – I understand what my responsibilities are, eliminates confusion in my life. So there's great peace that comes in. Peace comes through alignment. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, the Bible tells us that God's not the author of confusion, but of peace. And that peace comes through biblical order or proper alignment. So whenever I submit to a mission, a great peace comes in my life because I've ended a struggle with God's will for my life. So that's where the peace comes and the joy, of course, joy comes from the Holy Spirit who gives us joy because we are in God's will. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Well, before we go to break, Dr. John, if you would, please, can you remind everyone what is the title of your book? Where can we get a copy? And how do we stay in contact with you? Sure. The name of my book is Biblical Headship. I'm making sense of, of submission to authority. Uh, you can obtain it uh, at johnpolis.com. That's my bookstore online, johnpolis.com. Uh, it's on Barnes & Noble. Uh, it's on Amazon. And I can be contacted on Facebook, John Polis, on Instagram, on Twitter. And uh, my email address is just simply Dr. John. J-O-H-N at R-F-I-U-S-A dot org. 
Alrighty, listeners, now you know where you can pick up a copy of the book. We'll be back right after this. Anne, Camilla, William, and Fred. The four in the Humvee are on a perilous journey, halfway across the country to a tent city near the Mississippi River, a long ways from Boston. Through each bend and turn, they meet some people in need and others who have evil in their souls. Four unlikely heroes in a Humvee on an unlikely trip. The recipe for a captivating story. Grab this book, EMP Casualty by Michael Kravitz. Discovery, not just a sec. What would it look like if we listened more? Could the right voice, the right set of words, bring us all just a little closer, get us to open up, even push us further? It could if we took the time to listen. The most inspiring minds, the most compelling stories. Download Audible and listen for a change. Hi everyone, Dr. Angela here. Did you know that Daily Spark is now on Facebook? That's right, you can visit with me at facebook.com forward slash Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I want to know more about what you're thinking. I'd love to know which interview did you find the most entertaining or the most informative. I want to talk to you and I want you to be able to talk to me. Simply visit facebook.com forward slash Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. And we are back. Thank you so much for joining me for Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I am your host, Dr. Angela Chester. My guest today is Dr. John Polis, and he has written the book, Biblical Headship, Making Sense of Submission to Authority. That's right, folks. We are talking about alignment and accountability today. We all need to make sure that we are in that perfect alignment, and we need to be accountable not only for the things that we do, but also our mindset, how we go about our lives, and what a wonderful way to get started with a new season in our lives. So, Dr. John, I want to ask you the, the, this particular question when it comes to um, the institutions. What are the institutions that require headship? Well, the, the concept of headship, of course, is God's form of government that he has chosen for the church and for the family. Of course, government itself, Romans 13, tells us that God is the author of the concept of government itself. And government is is very important. It it tells us in Romans 13, the Apostle Paul taught us that government was there to reward evildoers and to uh, uh, reward those who do good as well. Government's there for our safety, for our protection. When government, of course, follows biblical principles, then man is blessed. And that's a very, very important idea. Uh, When it comes to government, there are kind of two different forms of government. There's democracy and theocracy. The democratic form of government is is what God chose for civilian Mm -hmm. life, for for our country, Mm -hmm. you know. The rule of uh, democracy is the rule by the majority. When it comes to the church, theocracy is God rule, and it it means God rules through delegated authority in the church. In in the church, all authority is delegated by a higher authority, not through an election. And so that's where the concept of headship comes in in the church. God appointed the husband to be the head of the church, Uh, the head of the wife, God appointed Jesus Christ to be the head of the church when he raised him from the dead and gave him that name which is above every name, the Lord Jesus Christ. He became the head of the church then. And, and, uh, And in the local church, there's headship, which is what eldership is all about. Your, your elders in the local church are the headship of the local church. So God created government headship really is for the family and for the church because it's theocratic in nature as opposed to democratic. 
Mm-hmm. Now, do you do you think that personal alignment and personal accountability um, have anything to do with people's misunderstanding as far as accountability and alignment when it comes to the church or when it comes to our faith? Well, you know, the idea of accountability is so very important. It, accountability just simply means that I'm willing to give an account of my actions, my choices, my decisions, my behavior. It's not that someone else uh, is telling me what to decide or what to do. I have a free will. God gave me that free will. But I should be willing to give an account of my actions, of my decisions, to those people in my life that I have relationship with that are an, an important part of my life. In fact, the Bible even tells us in Ephesians 5.20, that we should submit ourselves one to another in the fear of God or out of respect for God. So, you know, like if I see my brother or sister in Christ, I'm committing overtly, committing a sin, uh, there's something the Bible outlaws, for example, and I, I should be willing to or able to go to my brother and say, brother, uh, may I ask you, you know, why are you involved in doing such and such thing or how is this going to benefit your life? And, We need to be able to hold each other accountable because within that accountability, there's safety and protection. And that's really what God wants us to have is that safety and protection. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, you really said something important there, and I don't think that uh, people understand that. In in today's climate, the same way that they they did in in a different time, in that no one is trying to throw you under the bus or embarrass you or you know any of those negative words associated with it, but just from that sense of Christian love that you see that that person is is doing something that may cause them to you know slip a little or go. It, off into a wrong path and just trying to help them uh, get back on the right path. And, and, and the reason why I, I kind of highlight that a little bit is because I think our listeners would agree that if you were a, a gym buddy or if you were a diet buddy with someone and, like you said, you saw them not going to the gym or you saw them eating, you know, too many fries or chips or an extra burger or pizza or whatever, and you said something to them, people are okay with that. But it seems like when it comes to um, making sure that we're, do, we're living our best Christian life, people get a little um, sticky, a little <laughs> iffy there, but yet we still need to do that. In, in our walk. I, I love that you've highlighted that. Thank you for that. Now, mm-hmm. when it comes to alignment and headship, would you say that the, the better leader or the best leader is the one that is more aligned, or should we give room for someone to grow and become better? Well, absolutely. Everybody needs to have uh, given be given the space to grow, and the ch- babies uh, fall and crawl before they walk. And you know, we we have to give naturally and spiritually. Truth is parallel. People need time to grow. They need the right kind of instruction and in- healthy environment in which to grow. But alignment. Uh, healthy leaders are leaders that are themselves aligned. I like to say it like this, if you have pastors mm-hmm. maybe listening today, uh, that because I become a shepherd doesn't mean I'm no longer a sheep. So right. many times <laughs> many, many times, pastors, when they become a, a pastor of a church, then they, they don't really have anybody they're accountable to. They forget that they're a sheep and that they still need shepherding in their own life and there are senior shepherds out there that have been there longer more mature spiritual fathers if you will that that they need to find safety in that relationship and allow intimacy to come and when i say intimacy i like to say it like this into me see so (laughs) intimacy means i'm letting you see into me and and i'm and i'm i'm able to see into you and that's where we, we have safety because we, uh, we open up our hearts and we're not hiding anything. 
And that's, mm-hmm. that's where the safety and honesty and integrity of heart keeps us safe and enables us to fulfill our calling and destiny in life. So alignment, I, I believe I should be aligned with people that are also aligned because then I know they're living in yeah. safety mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and openness, and I feel safe and secure in that relationship. And when I'm aligned with something greater than myself, something more mature, more developed, more established, then the blessing that, that they have on their life, it comes to me as well. That's the benefit of alignment. The Bible teaches in Psalm 133 that the blessing flows from the head down and covers the whole body. So when I find headship, in other words, in my life, and I align properly with that headship by being accountable to the mission that, that they have, being obedient to whatever the requirements are for participation in that, in that mission, then the blessing of that greater ministry falls upon my life. And I grow from that, and I, I become more productive, more prosperous, uh, have more peace, everything comes by aligning with something greater than myself. And, of course, that's the headship principle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I love that you mentioned that um, if you want to be accountable, that we need to be around other people that want to be accountable. And I think we we forget that. We we know the scripture, iron sharpens iron. We we know that it's there, but I think sometimes we we forget how to apply it to our everyday life. Um, we as entrepreneurs or uh, teachers or or business people, we we we're quick to put stuff out there on Twitter or share a meme, but we forget to apply it so many times within our spiritual lives. And we we have to remember that that is important. That it's in the Bible first. It's not just a quote, <laughs> you know, that someone else has put out there. But that is it really and truly is important. I, I love that. Now, when it when it comes to um, confusion. And I think anyone who has lived any length of life has run into some form of chaos and confusion. What is the cause of confusion when it comes to a biblical institution? Well, uh, again, 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul addressed that subject when he spoke to the Corinthian church. There was a lot of confusion going on among the believers in terms of how the spiritual gifts were to be manifested and regulated in the church and how uh, when they had their agape feasts, their, 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 their dinners together with, with the, the whole church, how, what was the protocol involved there because there was confusion in, in uh, uh, the class, class struggles. You know, the wealthy people sat and ate with, wouldn't sit and eat with the, with the poor people, one thing and another. And the Apostle Paul wrote, and he said, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. And that's in verse 33. But then if you go down to verse 40, 1 Corinthians 14, 40, he gives the answer. He says that God's not the author of confusion, but of peace. And he said, let everything be done decently and in order. So the, the mm-hmm. way to eliminate... Mm-hmm. the the way to eliminate confusion is to find God's order. For example, in the home, if if the God had ordained the husband to be the head, and the wife, even though she's equal in in spiritually and in, in mentally and in, in every way she's the equal, but yet she has to allow that husband to be the one God holds accountable for the will of God being done. Then order is established, and then the children. The Bible says are in subjection to their parents with all gravity. They learn how to honor their parents and obey that first, uh, uh, the first institution where there's authority is in the home, and that's where children learn it. And the Bible said the benefit of that is that they're going to live a long and successful and healthy life. So what happens is there's no peace, there's no confusion in that family. When that family is set in order biblically, the peace of God, rules that home and where there's peace it's uh, the word shalom is the hebrew word it means safety it means uh completeness in number uh in other words all the blessings god intends for you can be manifested in that environment where there's peace in the absence of war so 
in the home, we have to get things set in order. In the church, the same way. We have a set man, the Bible calls that senior elder, if you will, the person that God holds accountable for his will to be done in that church is that said person, senior pastor, senior elder, bishop. There's a lot of different terms depending on what, what uh, group you're with. Right. But whenever, whenever we have that said person that's a recognized leader with his team of consultative leaders like the eldership that has been raised up in that ministry to be a part of that team, and then the deacons who serve under the uh, leadership of the elders, and then the members under down uh, underneath the deacons there. It's just a, a flow chart. You have peace in that church. I've been a pastor now 40 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, at the time I wrote that book, I think it said 30, but 2020 is 40 years for my wife and I, who have been married 45 years, by the way. And all four of our children are Christians. Two of my, my sons are mm-hmm. preachers. Uh, our, our eight grandchildren all go to church and love Jesus. It, you know, our home is blessed. It's been blessed with divine health. Yeah. It's been mm-hmm. blessed with prosperity. All because from the very beginning we found out about order and how to align ourselves biblically with headship and in the home, in the church. And the blessing has just flowed continually in our life. And uh, we expect that to continue the rest of our lives. Absolutely. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And, you know, I think that with with so many um, families, when we look at traditional families, that's something that is still instituted. That is something that is in place, is that everyone understands that the husband or dad is the head of the family. Mom might rule the roost, so to speak. You know, she might make the, the household function and work and all of that. But that it really, it all comes down to what what is dad doing and, and how does he make sure that the family functions. I love it. I love it. I have, to, I have to agree with you on that one. Now, Dr. John, I, we only have about two minutes left in the show, but I want to ask you one more question, and that is about increasing our peace. I know that so many people out there are going, you know, I'm, I'm fine as far as, you know, reading my Bible or attending church, but I want to increase my my peace, and my happiness. How can people do that? What can they do? Well, that's a great question. You know, there, when you study the subject of peace, you have peace with God first and foremost. Romans 5, 1 said, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. So, you know, at one point before we reconcile with God, the Bible actually calls us God's enemies because when we are living in a life of sin and disobedience, we're actually at war with God. And when we finally accept the fact that God is God and that we've got to give an account of ourselves to him one day, and we accept his free forgiveness through Jesus Christ, and we are reconciled to God, we're, now we're at peace with him, no longer at war. We have peace with God. So we can be assured that now there's, there's nothing between God and, and me. I'm at peace with him. We have been reconciled. We're now one. But then there's the peace of God, and that is that quality of peace in our life where we have undisturbed composure. That's what the Amplified Bible calls peace, that undisturbed composure. And, wow, we can have that without any external uh, source whatsoever because the Bible said, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Okay, so here's the key to that. Philippians 4, 6, it said, be, be anxious for nothing. Uh, the world's living in anxiety. It doesn't have that peace or that undisturbed undistur- composure. But they can. Paul said, be anxious for nothing, but let, let your requests be made unto God with thanksgiving. And the peace of God that pass all understanding shall guard your hearts and minds. So what does it mean to to um, let our requests be made known unto God, to cast our care upon the Lord. Really, that means to make God responsible for the outcome of the situation. When I've learned to make God responsible, whether it's my wayward children, whether it's a a loved one that, that I'm struggling with, whether it's an economic problem, whatever it might be, if I make God responsible for the outcome of the situation, then I have peace because that's what we really worry about is the outcome. 
of the situation. How's it going to turn out? What's going to happen? When I make God responsible for all the outcomes, then I can live in peace, and I know ahead of time what's going to happen because God's going to do whatever he said in his word he's going to do. So I cast my care. I say, Lord, I'm, I make you responsible for the outcome, and I know what that's going to be already because you've already told me what you're going to do in your word. And I can live with the peace of God in my heart. There's three things, Dr. Angela, real quick, in that passage, Philippians 4, 6 through 8. First thing you have to do in verse 6, cast your care on the Lord. The second thing, he said, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good, report, of any praise, if there's any virtue, think on these things, we have to control our thought life. So we have to cast our care, make God responsible. We have to then control our thought life. And then finally, Paul said, verse 9, the things which you've seen, heard, uh, witnessed in me, these do also, and the God of peace will be with you. So we have to copy our mentors. A little three-point outline, how to get free from worry. Cast your care, Philippians 4, 6. Control your thoughts, verse 7 and 8. Verse 9, copy your mentors. That's where the headship comes in. Who am I aligned with? I can follow their the faith that they've walked in and see the peace they have in their life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love it. What a great note to end the show on. Well, Dr. John, one last time, if you could please, can you remind everyone, what is the title of your book, when can we pick up a copy, and how do we follow you online? Biblical Headship is the name of our book, Making Sense of Submission to Authority. And we can find that book plus all of my books on different subjects at johnpolis.com, johnpolis.com. And and my books are on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Uh, You can find me on Twitter, John Polis on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. And if you want to email me, it's drjohn at RFI. USA.org. Dr. John, thank you so much for being on Daily Spot with Dr. Angela today. And thank you so much. I've enjoyed it. And listeners, thank you as well for tuning in and spending some time with me today. As always, may you continue to find God's grace and mercy in everything that you do. Until next time, everyone, be blessed in the Lord. Bye-bye.